Hello everyone, welcome back to Soccer 60. This is episode 4. What is Soccer 60? We are a youth football podcast where we bring coaches in and also those in the industry to talk a bit more and also dissect more about that industry. Towards the end of the show, we are going to answer some of your questions. Uh, so be sure to send them in via our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. In this podcast, your usual suspects are myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston, and for today, we have radio journalist and one of our coaches, Keshika Subarao. Hi guys, how are you guys doing? Yeah, very well, thank you, Henry. Kesh, how are you? Good, good, doing well. Did you guys know that today is a replacement public holiday? Re- replacement for what? Uh, it's a Nuzo Al Quran. Uh, yesterday was the celebration. Okay. <laughs> you <Well, that- laughs> All the days feel the same, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. I think I asked the question last week. This is mm. going to be a rhetoric one until we end the MCO, I think. Anyways. But I had, a, I had a bit of a stressful weekend, to be honest. Oh, no. Yeah. What happened? Mod- Mother's Day, isn't it? That's a very stressful time. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you guys don't appreciate what it's like at the moment. You, as, as, a, as a son and a daughter, it's very easy, right? You buy your mum flowers or whatever it is, uh, mm-hmm. maybe a nice card. But when you are married, it's a whole new world of pressure. Because you all of a sudden have to uh, make sure your wife is happy, make sure that your kids get something nice for your wife or her, for their mother. It's a very stressful time. <laughs> I would say I performed. Av- uh, I would say I performed averagely over the weekend. Oh no! <laughs> but anyways, uh, it's a good time for us to also wish you guys uh, those uh, mothers, uh, pet moms, proper moms, happy Mother Day, happy, happy Mother's Day, uh, belated Mother's Day from us. At Soccer 60. Did, um, did you just say pet mums? Yeah. That means some people consider themselves pet mums. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a mom to two cats. I'm like, all right. Um, okay, Are you, guys, you a mum to can. two cats, Henry? I am a mum to nobody, unfortunately. Um, I am a mum to... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyways, we're going to move on from the little bit of that uh, We're going to do a bit of a housekeeping Now, Andy, you can keep us current on what is going on with the league Andy? Yeah, I'm going to keep it quite brief this week Because I'm so eager to find out about that shirt of Keshe's um, So mm-hmm. let's rattle through the news uh, We've introduced a new spin to win competition on our website uh, So you can go on to our website, littleleague.com.my uh, Spin a wheel and win some great prizes There's some free sessions there, even a free month of training 20 ringgit vouchers You can't lose, get on there, give it a go um, Great little feature to enjoy whilst you're stuck at home Uh, We also have the ongoing weekend and weekday sessions, Wednesday afternoon, 4 o'clock, Saturday and Sunday, 9 to 10 a.m. Use the the promo code SOCCER60 at the checkout to get these sessions completely free of charge. Uh, Again, we've got Coach Nidal on it this week. Um, He's really getting the hang of teaching these sessions online in your living room. As always, all you need is a football, a bottle of water. Get on there, give it a go. We've got daily skills. Last week was our daily skills with, with our very own Kesh, who sat here today. So she'll be able to explain a little bit what she did um, last week. But do get on there, have a look. This week, we've got Coach Abdullah coming up. So look out for that. Um, practice some, some new skills for when, you do, when we do finally get back out onto the pitch. And lastly, a reminder to please subscribe to a, this podcast. Give us a rating if there's anything you'd like to see differently on it. Uh, please do let us know and get in touch. Henry, how do they get in touch with us to give us the feedback? Well, you can always go onto your favorite podcasting platforms, put us a rating over there if it's five stars. If it's not five stars, just let us know in the comments at that platform. And that's about all the news from, from us at Little League. Let's get on to uh, news about that shirt from Cash. Yep. Um, before we move on, uh, don't forget, you can always find out these informations in Little League dot my www.littleleague.my. Okay, now we move on to, yes, explain that kid, Cash. All right, so um, Henry told me to wear a kit that has sentimental value to me. So I picked this kit because I no longer have my first coaching kit. But this kit is actually from Peterhead. Um, It's a football club. I think they're playing League One now in Scotland. So I think around 2016 or 2017, I was working for them as a writer for their club magazine. And basically, they told me that I could do whatever I want, I could write whatever I want, and they would give me the center for two page. So wow. I chose to write about um, the importance of football to different communities around the world. Um, even when they edit, it wasn't too much, and j- just complete free reign of, of, of creativity to, for me to do whatever I want. And at that time, I was kind of in between trying to decide whether I wanted to stay in football or 
you know, do something else. So at that time, to have this opportunity meant a lot. Because as I was writing why football was important to different people, um, it reminded me of the importance of football to myself. But the highlight of the whole experience was, I was current at that time. I was um, traveling between UK uh, and the Middle East and Malaysia. I was all over the place, and they asked me for an address, and I didn't know why. But I just gave them my parents' address here in KL, and they sent me this kit with like a handwritten note with a club letterhead from the director thanking me and all this. So it came at a time where I was not sure if I wanted to be football, and it played a huge role in for, uh, me making the decision to stay. Right, hands down. That is the best explanation of a kit that we've had so far. And yes. I think it's going to be very hard to top. Yes. So we've got, we've got Simon on next week. So pressure's <laughs> on Simon. <laughs> I love this. That was a very great story to hear from you because that will actually really smoothly transition us to the very first part of the podcast, which is an introduction to Coach Keshka. So Coach Keshka, give us a bit of a background of yourself and how you got yourself into football eventually. Okay, so... I, I love football from, from a very young age. Um, I started watching football when I was five or six years old. Didn't quite understand the full extent of it and how it works, but I found it fascinating. But back then in Malaysia, it wasn't a norm for girls to be interested in football, to play football or anything like that. And then I was just watching basically for fun. Um, and I went to a Chinese school. So in Chinese school, you don't have uh, football. It's not a thing. So we have basketball, um, we had volleyball, table tennis, badminton, but no football at all. We had a huge field. You don't even have goalposts on the field. So <laughs> being in primary school, like, there wasn't any opportunity for me to play football. So I ended up playing basketball and volleyball throughout like, the whole six years. And then I moved on to high school. High school, it was a mixed school, but again, girls can't play football. The only time we get to play sports was pretty much during physical education. But mm. during that, the boys would be allowed to go to the field to play football. And then the girls, you have to basically sit and sit in the classroom or you get to play like hula hoops or skipping ropes or something silly like that. Um, <laughs> and because we didn't have a, a football team and none of the girls wanted to play either, so I didn't get to play in high school. But I was kind of frustrated because there's no way for me to be part of football. And a lot of the academies at that time in Malaysia didn't want a girl to join in their training session either. So if I approached them, it was always like, oh, you know, we don't have a girl yet. Wait around. Maybe if we get two or three girls, then you can join in. So I kind of gave up and started continue playing um, basketball, volleyball. And then I started writing. So I would write uh, football articles for a lot of websites. And mm -hmm. back then... Um, all this blogging and online media publications were still starting out. It was a brand new thing back then online. So they wouldn't check for resume. So you don't have to actually disclose your age or anything like that. All they wanted was a sample essay. So mm. I would write about football. They wouldn't know who I was or I'm a kid or none of that. So it was good enough. They got, got me to be writers for several different blogs and media publications. So that's how I started. So at least there was some sort of way that I could be part of football. And then when I was around 16, I decided, I heard that Southampton Solon had a course, a football degree. So I thought that's what I wanted to do. So I applied, I got in. They told me that it's a conditional offer because I was too young and I haven't finished high school. So they told me that when I get to a point where I'm almost done with high school, I should do a bridging course. And they recommended this um, college in Oxford so I had to do a foundation in science and then do the football degree. So initially, that's how I started. I went there to do the foundation in science, but I didn't follow through with doing the football degree. Yes, you didn't follow through with that because you eventually went on to do law. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so after your law degree, you decided to go back to football. Why? Um, I did the law degree knowing that I'll always end up in football. I did the law degree because when I was in college, everyone told me that you know, it's very strange for a girl to, to want to do a football degree and have no backup in anything else and being so young as well. And I think someone told me that one of the counsellors or uh, guidance counsellor told me that the odds of working in football was something crazy like 1 in 50,000. And then he added that you know, that's for a guy, so for a girl it's much worse. And if you don't succeed, there's nothing else as a backup. So then I thought the wise thing would be to do something that can eventually lead me into football. And if it, 
I feel in terms of coaching or media side, then I can always do sports law and get into football. And for me, um, doing a law degree was sort of easy because it's basically reading and then you're, you're grasping different principles and applying. So it's not okay. a lot of, you know, maths or something like that. And so that frees me up to actually continue doing like coaching licenses and continue working in the media side of uh, football as well. Hmm. I don't know where to begin with that. There's, there's so many ways to probe into that. But I'll, I'll start by mentioning that I didn't realize you'd gone to Southampton Solent. Uh, that was my big rival when I was at university. I went to <laughs> South- I didn't I didn't go because oh, I you didn't switched go. Okay. to law degree. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's reassuring to know. Um, but you said that you got into football at five to six years old. Um, what was it that, that got you into football? And presumably there was some parental influence around at that time. And how did they respond to when you started to get into football yourself? Um, so basically, I grew up uh, having my dad's uh, football trophies and all the photographs around the house. And so I would ask him to tell me the stories. And I thought it was very fascinating. And then I think it was the 2002 World Cup. So that was a major turning point for me because we would watch almost all the matches and it was a very big deal. That's when I started getting very into football. And then um, even in schools, like I would write essays in football, so my parents would check them and they would get like really good grades. So they kind of knew all along that there was a lot of interest then. I was kind of going that path, but no one really expected it to be something so serious. But eventually when they saw the results, I think they were okay with it. So they were pretty supportive of you going off to the UK to follow a football course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not, not sure there's too many parents that would be uh, be happy with that. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting. Another interesting part is that I think if you guys are aware, if you are on your drive back home at Fridays around 8 o'clock, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Cash, but you are part of the BFM Pundit crew uh, at that time as well with Ross Yusof, Craig Morais. Um, uh, how did you get yourself in there like was it through like your writing or was it through coaching i'm presuming that by the time you came back you were coaching already right yeah so i'm not quite sure if it's writing or coaching but what had happened was when i came back to malaysia uh for a while i was working with like tv stations and some radio programs and then i would attend a lot of embassy events because um i was coaching with the marginalized communities that the embassy support and that's how I met Freda. So Freda is one of the producer and hosts in BFM. Mm. And she has um, this women show. So it's a one hour show where they invite women guests to talk about their career and their industry. And she invited me to talk about football. And mm. then I got to know her. That's the first time I went to BFM. And then uh, I think about a year later, so that's how they got to know about me as well. A year later, then I was asked to come on the show. No, actually I was asked to do a sports personality interview. In, in the summer, I think, because we didn't have Premier League going on. So that was what was used to fill in the slots. Right. And then I did one of those. And that's how I got to know Ross better. And then eventually that led to me being on the football show. Ah, okay. Well, that's a bit more about uh, Coach Cash in terms of in a nutshell. Now we go on to something more specific, which is how did you find Little League Soccer? How did you discover us? Like, how did you find Little League Soccer? So that's actually a very interesting story because I actually didn't want to join. So um, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's a very good reason. So what happened was um, when I came back to Malaysia, uh, I was kind of coaching all over the place. So back when I was in the UK, I would spend my summers in Malaysia coaching. But that was mostly with um, you know embassies and UNH. So it's very sort of sheltered environment. So no one makes a big deal that there's a female coach coaching or anything like that. Especially when you work with people like American Embassy where they're so used to having uh, females in in sports, uh, especially football. But then when I started venturing out of there, when I finally moved back here permanently, um, that's when I realized that people see girls in football very differently. So I had a lot of issues with people having problems with that. So um, I think, you know, people would sometimes threaten you, you know, on the pitch. And then people have issues, basically. But then everything escalated when one of the final academies that I worked for before joining Little League, um, basically the owner of that academy was constantly harassing me. But no one in the academy seemed to even think there was an issue or anything like that. And then eventually I I left on not, well, not bad terms, but I just kind of left. 
and then I decided to quit and football. And we basically. we were we were what was left. <laughs> Not really. No, no, no. Went around all the academies. <laughs> Can't do anything else. Just get a little bit. Yeah, so all right, I guess you do. <laughs> It's pretty much the same story like everywhere, you know, when I was coaching with certain mm. schools, with certain clubs, everything was pretty much the same. So I told myself that, you know, maybe I should take a break and stop football. Um, so that's what I did. And then I ended up teaching Mandarin for a while because I didn't want to do anything sports related. Um, and then I slowly started getting back into football media at that point. And that I was pretty much doing it full time when John, like Coach Jonathan, mm -hmm. he was one of the colleagues in one of the previous places that I worked. And mm -hmm. he texted me saying that Little League is looking for a female coach for the new girls program. But he didn't mention the girls program. He just said that they were looking for a female coach. And I told him that I wasn't interested. Um, I didn't want to coach anymore. <laughs> and then he told me, like, it's okay, you know, just I'll just give your number to the management and then just have a chat and see if wh what happens and all that. So eventually I thought, all right, I'll just go and listen and see what they're about. Mm -hmm. And then I went into the office and I met um, the management team. So I met Shazwan, I met Mark, and they told me what they were trying to do, you know, trying to start a girls team. And I thought I would come on because if, you know, I never got an opportunity to play much. So if mm. me being around there and that helps some, some girl, even if it's one girl to join in to play football, then it makes a difference. So I thought I'll join and see how it goes for the first few months and, and go from there. Mm hmm um, Andy, do you have anything to add on in terms of her story joining Little League? Um, no, I mean, like, from my point of view, uh, I've never looked uh, at hiring men or women. Uh, I look at hiring coaches, right? And um, from, from what I remember, we weren't actually specifically looking to start a girls team. Um, mm. And I think, you know, as we get further into this, you'll realize now Kesh is not actually coaching any of the girls teams. And no. I, I, think yep. that, I think that it's not necessarily that you uh, need a female coach to run female teams. That's, that's often um, assumed, but it's far from the truth. Uh, but I think that having that uh, f female coach makes it a bit more of a, a welcoming environment for the initial girls to come and join the academy. Um, so I think that that's really important that we hire Kesh to come in as a female coach. And it led on to um, girls teams being formed for us. But it it's not necessarily the best way to run girls teams once they are established. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit um, later yep. on. But, you know, we never looked at Kesh as, oh, we need a female coach. Which female coach is available? Let's let's go and get one. It was never like that. The opportunity came and presented itself. And, you know, I think that the best hires are always uh, not necessarily when you're looking for something. It's just something that, that falls in your lap. And, um, you know, we've certainly been very happy with Kesh. And I think she's gone from strength to strength. And mm. uh, I, th I hope that she'll stay with us for a lot longer. And we we've kind of eradicated some of those um, bad experiences that, that she's had and, and hope to build some better ones for her in the future as well. So it's, uh, it's funny how it works sometimes. It does. It is quite funny how it works. Um, the extra itch that Coach Cash actually has is that not many people know this, but she has a FA Level 2 scouting badge. Uh, that actually, to me, is a huge edge in this circle of coaches that we have so far. Um, but what led you to do the papers, Cash, and how has it influenced your coaching and selection of players? Um, so back then, I was still in, in the UK and mm. I was still working in the European football media side. I was already done with my law degree at this point, And so I was coaching more and pretty much doing football all the time. Mm. And then um, I guess word kind of spread around. So the owner of uh, PFSA, which is the Professional Football Scouting Association, um, David Hobson. So he contacted me and he told me that he had heard of me and he thinks that there's not many women that are involved in the scouting side of football or, you know, as a scout or even take on the course just to see what it's about. Mm. And he wanted someone to give it a shot. And he told me that it's it's a fully paid like, full scholarship for me to go down to manchester and get it done and i think the biggest um thing that drew me was that it was held exactly opposite old trafford so i'm a huge man united fan mm -hmm. and it was at um hotel football which is in front of the main entrance so i thought you know that's pretty brilliant and all the scouts that were running the program at the time were affiliated with man united itself so i thought it'd be a great exper learning experience so i thought i'll go down and have a look um, did the course and learned a lot that I still apply today as well. Mm. Um, I think it really taught me how to select players and what are the more important things when it comes to players. It's not just about 
talent or how much how many players you can dribble past or any of those things right so that was a very valuable experience for me mm -hmm. um okay uh now that that also sets up for a good transition to the next topic which is the cultural differences between the uk and malaysia as a women's coach now and feel free to share your experience as well but i'm very keen to know more about how different is it coaching youth in the uk and in malaysia I think for me personally, the the gender aspect is the main one because mm -hmm. I started coaching when I was in the UK. So I was very obvious to the idea that people would think it's strange for girls to be a football coach because mm. everywhere I go, there was at least one female coach at some point. And even when there, there aren't any, no one made it feel like it's an odd thing to do that. Mm. So you don't feel awkward. You don't feel self-conscious or any of that. So when I first got my start, I got used to that idea and that environment. And then when I came back to Malaysia and started coaching, everyone pretty much had an issue with it. So that was a very big sort of a culture shock for me because mm. I don't understand why it's, it's different from UK and Malaysia. Like, why I would gender make a difference? I think obviously in an ideal world, gender should make no difference. But mm. I, I think clearly it does. And I would argue that it does in the UK uh, as well as Malaysia, maybe not as it manifests itself quite the same way. But do you think it was easier to get into coaching in the UK uh, because of that? Or do you think it, it's possibly easier to get jobs in Malaysia because you stand out as a female coach? Like, is, is there any kind of positive aspect that comes from it that way? Um, I think the major difference is that, you know, even in terms of the law that you're not allowed to discriminate. I mean, obviously, there are discrimination, but it's n it can't be as obvious. But like for but instance, but again, like I I in that sense, like uh, you know, if a, a football club is uh, required by law to have X number female employees, um, does it make it easier to get a job there, or does it actually make it more competitive? Uh, because they, you know, they they're going to have people, uh, women applying for those jobs because they know that they have to employ somebody. So does that actually make more women want to go into that sector versus back home here in Malaysia? If you're a female and you're in the football industry, there's less competition. Is there, is there any advantages to that or not? I don't think so because there's, when it comes down to the gender thing in football, it's not about competition between the, the same gender. It's more about people's willingness to accept women being in that environment and working in that environment. So even if we have like job opportunities here, they're not quite open to having a woman take that position. In the UK, maybe they have that, that idea that they wouldn't want women to work there, but eventually it's not a big deal. It gets looked over very quickly. Does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, I mean, like I find it fascinating because there's a lot of um, talk in football about equal rights. And yep. there was a big um, court case in, in America uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. the, the U.S. women's team taking um, taking to court the matter of equal pay. And yep. I find it a fascinating subject because, again, in an ideal world, everybody wants equal opportunities, equal pay. But at the end of the day, Football is a spectator sport. It's entertainment. And, you know, it, it very much comes down to the fact that the men's game is watched by far more people than the women's game. Now, you can argue all day long whether that's correct or incorrect or, or whatever, but that then um, inhibits what kind of uh, TV rights the women's um, teams can get, uh, what kind of exposure they get for sponsorship deals and stuff like that. And it has this massive knock-on effect that... Yep is not necessarily obvious so it's very interesting to hear from insider's perspective how it um, affects things at the grassroots level as well because mm. it's it's not i don't think it's just as simple to say yeah equal opportunities for everybody everybody gets jobs you know it's not quite as simple as that so it, it's a very fascinating uh point and it's not one i think that's easily solved um mm. and we just have to try and do our best to be level-headed people about it yeah yeah um cash do you, is there any plus points um, that can be taken from the UK in terms of youth coaching uh, as a woman um, that can be applied here or should be applied here in Malaysia and anything from Malaysia that we can also apply in the UK? I think would, 
it would be just to normalize having female coaches, not to mm. make it such a big deal and right. get everyone to get on the same page in terms of understanding that. Mm. Uh, I, I think that's the main thing. Mm, okay. Okay, I think that's that's quite a good point as well to bring us to the next topic, um, which is where we just dissect more about one issue or at least one topic of the day. And this episode, uh, we are going to talk about being a woman coach. Now, Cash, it's a huge deal to be a football coach in your position, right? At least here, it's not that celebrated yet. What does it mean, in your own words, to be a football coach, a youth football coach? Well, for me, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, I told you, like, I love football from a young age, always yep. have, and I think I always will. So to be able to share that love and the passion that I have for football with the younger generation, I think that in itself is what coaching should be about. So that's that's what it means to me. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's uh, really interesting talking to Kesh about this because being a, a football coach or being anything involved in sport in Malaysia in general is generally frowned, frowned upon by uh, parents, grandparents. You know. Now you add into the fact that you're talking about women, mm-hmm. it's even more uh, niche market, yep. right? So it, it's very fascinating to see how um, not only does uh, Kesh get that, that kind of experience and what it means to her, but how it's how she was able to get the opportunity to get into this position in the first place. Yeah. I'm sure there's lots of young girls out there that would like to go up and, and be involved in sport or potentially a football coach, um, but are not provided the correct pathways by their family or the education system or whatever. It's not geared up to welcome people into a coaching world. And if you're a female battling through that, I would imagine it's just even harder. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Cash? I think it's very much set up to be working for male rather than female in terms of football in general, anywhere in the world. It's right. a sport yeah. that's um, designed to suit guys, not for girls. So if you want to get into it, then there's so many things that you have to do. You have to adapt. You have to change yourself. But it all comes down to how much you want it. And I think for me, what I always told myself is that if I want to quit or leave, it has to be on my terms. I'm not going to be forced out because people think that, you know, women shouldn't be part of it. If there's a really, really good reason, a logical reason, then that's something that I can consider. But no one's been able to provide that. So to me, it just feels like it makes no sense. Mm. How would you, Kesh, in Malaysia, how would you advise uh, a young girl that was interested in taking a similar path to you? What would be the best way for them to go about it? I would say get into, start playing as anywhere that you can in schools and in local clubs because I think nowadays it's a bit more accepted. If you go to any club, I think they would think a bit more before turning a girl away. Um, It's going to be hard because, you know, you will have to probably be the only one of the only girl in that environment, but don't let that discourage you. Just focus on learning. I think that's what it should be. Your focus really determines how long you stay in it. So if you're focused on learning and growth, all the other things wouldn't matter as much. It's difficult, but it won't matter quite as much. Do you know much about the the female football scene in Malaysia? Uh, not really, because um, it then doesn't seem to be much coverage about it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my my knowledge is is admittedly woeful of the subject but from what i do know there seems to be a fairly abundant futsal scene um there's there's quite a lot of women's futsal teams that play in in leagues that are organized and stuff but very little to do with with football itself Mm. um and if you look at uh the air asia junior league that we have set up for for youngsters um we're lucky in that we now have three age groups for the girls 13s 15s and 18s which is great but we have you know what 170 t- boys teams in the league yep. and like 30 girls teams right and and those 30 girls teams are made up of three or four academies and that's it right it, it's very difficult um to get that interest level so far and I, I hope that that continues to grow and you know we sit here a year in a year's time and we're talking about the the, the girls division having uh, eight nine ten teams um uh, and I hope that that's providing some kind of pathway. But beyond that, like I said, outside of futsal, I don't know much that goes on for girls. Right. I think so it's mostly oh. because um, 
it's frowned upon uh, for people to see girls playing football. There's always that issue about, you know, oh, don't wear shorts and don't don't mix around with boys, don't go to the field, um, you'll get sunburned and all this nonsense. I think <laughs> all of those have to be removed and then make it normal. That's why it's so important to normalize football as another sport. Yeah, I agree with you on, on that, guys. Um, but uh, in terms of in the Klang Valley alone, uh, there are also a lot of social football scenes that are coming up uh, right now, recreational football scenes that are coming out right now that actually encourages girls to come on and play for them, be- uh, regardless what level you guys are, right? And I think that that is, to me, a stepping stone to a next generation of people who view football as a sport for all uh, and not just for men. And I, I, I really find that initiative quite um, interesting. Uh, they do it, and, and the one thing to kind of counter what uh, you said before, which was the sun, was that they play at night. So there is no factor of the sun, they're not going to get tanned. Um, and I, I, I think it's great. I, I, I like where this is going right now. It's going to create more, um, a, a, a platform for more girls to go and enjoy the sport. Um, now that being said, right, we go back down more to the youth level. Uh, I want to know more about how the different age groups um, look at you as a coach. Uh, now you have the you have coached the under tens before with Little League. Uh, you have also you are also currently coaching the sixteens and the under eighteens of FC Kuala Lumpur. Um, do you see a difference in how they perceive you as a coach? Um, I think so, sorry, just just to clarify, you're talking about boys teams now, right? For yeah. the, for the, uh, the time yes, being. for now it's yeah. boys team, yep. Um, so usually when I coach the under 10s, whether that's Little League or school sessions or whatever, um, they will come up to me at first, when I, right before the session, and they'll ask me if I'm, I'm going to coach them, and am I their coach? Mm. And then when I say yes, they'll just bluntly say that we've never had a female coach before. And then was, they'll ask me about my favorite team, my favorite player, and why, and all these questions. So we'll have like a, a chat before the session about all of those. And then the session will start. They carry on as normal. After the session, they're fine with it. It's a completely normal thing for them. Is, for it, the har- is it harder uh, for them to have your respect because you're a female coach or because you're a Man United fan? <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem. idea. <laughs> I think that's the biggest problem you're facing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell them right in their face that 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 you're a United fan? Of course. <laughs> okay, how many of your kids that uh that are in the schools that you work with are actually United fans? Nowadays, quite less. <laughs> because all of them are Liverpool fans and Spurs fans. Pretty yeah, much. Well, we not go. Spurs, not Spurs. <laughs> Liverpool, <Oof>. yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have to get back to the schools and convert some now. We need some more Spurs fans. Uh, but yeah, so that is for the younger age group, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what about um the um. Older age group, Did, was it hard to get their respect, or were you actually seek? I'm very sure the word respect is a very strong word to use in this topic. But like, do you yearn for their respect, or do you expect them to give you that certain look for authority? Uh, not really. Basically, what happens is you know when we have tryouts, they would come in and they'll have their trial. They wouldn't say anything. No one would act like it's a weird thing. None of that, and then. After everything finish, we just carry on as normal. Those players that got selected will carry on as normal. No one would actually bring up the fact that they thought it's strange or anything like that. So I think a very interesting that happened last season was that we finished the season and then we were all hanging out or something like that. And then they actually came up and told me like, um, when we first came, we thought it was very strange that our coach is, is, is a young female coach. And we thought that it was not real and there will be some other coach that would take over later on. And then they just got used to the fact because after, after going through the training session, they realize it's not that different. So they just get used to it. Mm, mm. Um, now, speaking of getting used to it, you also had the chance to coach the girls' team. I want to know more about what you find different between coaching a girls' team and coaching a boys' team. Is there a huge difference between that? There's a difference. I don't think it's a huge difference. End of the day, it's about football, but... I think the difference comes from understanding because girls right. treat football as a sort of game, another sport, which is fine. But I think boys take it to the next level because a lot of the boys are very obsessed. You know, they want to be like their favorite players. They, they want to follow that, that lifestyle, the career path. They're obsessed with watching all the matches. And I find that girls don't have that. So when we start, we have to start at the very fundamental and it's about 
the game ra- itself rather than anything else beyond that. So I think that was very different and I wasn't used to that in the beginning. So that's something to you have to shift your perspective to get used to. Uh, how I do you oh, sorry Eddie, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have to be careful not to be too controversial on this subject, but mm. um, <laughs> uh, I have some quite interesting insights, I think, because I think most most people that would would look at Kesh uh, as a as a young female coach would immediately identify her towards the under sevens, under eights, under nine sort of age group. I think that that's a very easy assumption to make. But mm. for whatever reason, I think that um, Kesh has been um, always in my mind more geared up towards the older age groups. And right. I, I think it's, if you look at it on paper, it's not really a surprise because if you look at the qualifications, the experience that she's got, um, you know, th- she, she's more experienced than the majority of our coaches uh, right. in terms of the different fields of work that she's been in, the different qualifications that she's garnered for herself. And I think when you go through those kind of experiences, you want to be challenged with your football knowledge. And mm. to do that, you need to be working with the older age groups. And, you know, Kesh did a great job in getting the, the girls team set up. Um, when Kesh was running it, we had under th- under 12s and under 14s, I think, um, yep. for, for, the, for those age groups. And under 12 and under 14s girls football, um, again, try not to be too controversial, but it's not of the highest standard, right? Mm. It, you know, like Kesh said, like she's trying to make sure that they get interested and buy into the game and be focused on it and concentrate for the whole time and turn it into a passion of theirs. Boys at 12, 14 years old, if they're playing football, it's their passion, you know, Mm. and not a lot of girls at 12, 14, do you find that same level of passion with? Um, Whereas when you go to the under 16s and under 18s, boys that Kesha is now working with, they're there because they love football, right? That's the only reason they are still playing football is because they love it. And I think that when you love something and you're 16, 18 years old, you tend to be quite good at it. Otherwise, yep. you're, you're probably going to fall out of love with the sport, um, which allows Kesh, I think, to uh, express herself a lot more with her coaching, um, get into much more finer details, uh, pull on her qualifications a lot more. I mean, scouting uh, her scouting qualification that she has is very unique. There's not mm. many people in the world that have that, right? And yep. she's touched upon it a little bit. I'd like to get into a bit more information as to how that affects her coaching. Um, but you're not going to be using a, a scouting qualification that you've done with Scouts of Man United for 10-year-olds, right? It's it's not going to be the same thing. So it, that's going to be far more interesting for her to be involved with those older age groups at 16s and 18s. And so I think for me, it's it might seem strange from the outside as to why she's with our 16s and 18s. Yep. Um, but for me, it was, it's, I've always seen her as somebody that's been better with the older age groups. Mm. I, I agree with you on that as well because um, over the weekends, I would be going down to catch some games um, for to get material. And um, looking at the chemistry between the boys uh, with the coach uh, or with the 16s and 18s with you, uh, Cash, um, I realized there's, there is that, that good bond that they, they don't look at you as a woman's coach. Uh, they look at you as their coach. And they play for, you know, not only for FC Kuala Lumpur, they also play for you, um, which is something interesting to see now. And I, I, it's a good progress forward in terms of the youth scene. Now, speak, now, in that same vein, I'd like to know more about how coaches view you when they play against you. Uh, well, that's actually a pretty funny story about this. Um, before this, I wasn't too concerned. I mean, yeah, some coaches wouldn't come over and shake hand after it's done and all that last season. So it was fine. But this season, we actually had uh, a very interesting that, uh, thing that happened. So uh, one of my under-18 matches, we before the matches start, so my players were all hanging around and they knew the opposition, everyone that knew. And the opposition's coach actually told everyone at, I think, I think we were playing at Ardens. Um, he went around telling people that I'm not going to lose to a girl today. <laughs> so he <laughs> told his players to make sure that doesn't happen. So, uh, and then my players were telling me about it. But I thought that was pretty interesting that it, w- it made him so angry that there was an uh, opponent with a female coach. So I thought that was pretty funny. And but I you know, can't th- speak that's for everyone. Th- that, that, that's just an example of, of coaches putting them 
themselves ahead of the team that they're supposed to be coaching you know like take gender yeah. out take gender out of it it's just a ridiculous thing for a coach to say right the, the match is not for the coach's benefit it's for the kids right so it's just a ridiculous thing in general to say regardless of the gender yeah, yeah and and that reflects very much on the kids as well you don't want to be hearing that uh, from your coach saying like no, i'm not going to lose to a girl but like and, and it's going to create a very bad precedence for them because they're going to go in um going like or, or out in the future as well they're going to go like i'm not going to go lose to a girl no, but what i found yeah. that in that s- those situation is that it's actually a negative thing for your team because they're so focused on that instead of actually playing the match so i think it's pretty funny um in in terms of this is um what is the point right um i i don't know whether this is a very strong word to use but like what is the point um that you want to make here in the youth football industry as a woman coach I don't think I have a point to make mm. not anymore when I was younger I I felt like when I was 18 19 and on all, all that I felt like you have to prove that a girl can do things much better or or at least equal to a man and all these things but nowadays I just don't find there's any point to make mm-hmm. cuz what I want to do is enjoy my job enjoy football and when you're focused on doing all of that you kind of lose your direction a bit and football should always be focused on on your matches on on your players not on trying to prove a point to to people and those people don't matter anyway so i don't think uh, i have any point i'm i'm very very positive that for kesh to be sat here today she must have developed an extremely thick skin uh <laughs> to stu- to stupid comments like that oh, so yeah. again like i'm not surprised to hear that she doesn't have a point to prove it's, it's not about that um and that's You know that goes for all of our coaches at at Little League and FCKL as well. Like I don't want any of them to feel like they've got a point to prove. Everyone should just be doing the best that they can. Um, they're all there because they are are qualified and respected coaches. Um, one thing we don't do is carry dead weight. You know, if if somebody is not up to scratch, then we either put them through some training or pull them aside and have a word with them, or um, you know they'll they'll move on to something that suits them a bit better. But everybody is uh, who is employed by us is should be respected, and they don't have a point to prove. Of course, everyone wants to get better and improve as a coach, but that's different to trying to prove a point. Mm, fair enough. Yep. Uh, now we, Cash, do you have anyone that you take inspiration on, man or woman, when it comes to coaching? I don't think so because uh, growing up you don't see that like, female coaches so you mm-hmm. don't relate to male coaches either you can't re- as much as I like coaches like Ferguson and all that you can't relate to them on mm-hmm. on on a personal level so I mean you read the books you you take inspiration from them but I don't think in terms of coaches I have anyone like that mm-hmm. but what I can say that is that I take inspiration from my players Right. Because again, the age group that I have, they they tend to have a lot of questions, and they read on their own. They they do their own research, and they always come back to me with all these uh, deep questions about football and how to get better and their training regime. So that makes me work harder and do better as a coach, so that I can answer those questions better and be more equipped to deal mm. with those um, thing. And football changes very quickly as well. So to get into that that state, I think. I would say that my players would be my inspiration rather than having one coach or a single person. Right. Um I think that's a yep. I think it's a great point we touched on that a couple of weeks ago about if players ask you questions you better have the answers to it because yeah. otherwise you'll lose the respect of them immediately, you know. Um so of course when you start dealing with those older age group of kids the questions are going to become more detailed there's more of a chance of you having to say i'm not sure but let me get back to you um and you know if as long as you do it in a in a professional manner then it's okay to do that but you have to be very careful of of answering things incorrectly or not knowing your information yeah. because kids are great they'll call you out on it immediately mm-hmm. <laughs> um cash let's uh before we move on to our final segment of the show uh, i'd like to have you maybe say a message or if you have a message to tell uh, our viewers our listeners young and old on in terms of women coaching i think i would say just give women coaches or girls a chance don't have all those uh, it's hard not to have those preconceived um, ideas because you grew up in a culture or society that's so used to that it's a norm but if you see a female coach or a girl that's trying to get into football give them a chance 
don't don't make it seem like it's such a weird thing and make them feel uncomfortable or criticize them straight out um just give people a chance mhm all right that that actually gives us that's a very good end to our topic of the episode and we now move on to the final segment which is ask soccer 60 where we will or i will get some questions from instagram and also or from our coaches um to give to Andy and Cash to answer. Um Andy and Cash don't know what the questions are only I do. So let's have some fun with that. Um if you This is your favorite yeah. part, isn't it? You feel some I love power it. over us. I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> um if you have any questions for the future guests, do not hesitate to send them over on our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. Now, on to the first question. Now, first question is going to come from Pijan Rock. Uh Pijan Rock Ask how do you feel when opposition team underestimates us only because we have a female coach? I'm assuming he's one of your players, Cash. I think that's <laughs> Hafizan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Hafizan, the under 18 uh, captain. Mm. Um, I think again, once again, I always tell my player the same thing. So basically, those are variables that you can't control. So it's a waste of time to think about and try to to you know. Use that to play mind games and all that. I think that's all pointless. Um, mm. We train a few times a week, so I think we should focus on what we work in training, and then use that in the game, and then work on whatever mistakes we make in the game, and just you know repeat that. Focus on the, that process rather than p- other people's perspective and what they're trying to do and how they're trying to influence us. Mm. Mm. I think I think um, you know to go back to what we spoke about uh, a little bit earlier. Um, Players will initially question, "Oh, uh, I've got a female coach," or it may not even be a female coach. It may be uh, we've got a, a coach from Australia, or we've got a coach from England. Don't know how it's going to be. There's always going to be those initial questions when you get a new coach. But yep. as long as that coach gets your respect, and then you realize that they know what they're talking about, uh, you know, it will just become normal. You know, Kesh, Kesh for those under 18s, under 16s now, she's just their coach. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter to them that she's a she's a female or anything like that. They've worked together for long enough now that she's just their coach. And whenever you, uh, whenever you hear somebody say something bad about your coach, especially if you really like your coach and you respect them, it's just going to drive you on. It's going to make you more determined to to go out there and play for your coach. And we all know that the the best teams perform. Uh, to the best of their ability, when they have the utmost of respect for the coach and the person that they're putting their trust into to steer them in the right direction. So, if I was an opposition, I'd be avoiding saying things like that, mm. Pure, yeah. purely from a performance point of view. Yeah, that hubris is gonna uh, gonna cost your game. That's that's for sure. Um, now we move on to the next question. Uh, there's so many questions for me to choose from, actually. Uh, Vishnu Ne, uh, Vishnu Ne asks. What's the most difficult situation you had to face as a female coach in Malaysia? Hmm. Uh, th- there's a lot to to choose from and talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, it comes down to people's perception. I've had people um, who had problem with me being on the pitch just because um, of gender. So I've coached, I think, a while back uh, with the Dignity School. And they train in this open pitch. So while I was coaching them, we had this flats nearby as well. So all the thugs in the Santol area uh, were in yep, that flats. I live nearby. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah, was so was it you, Henry? Was it? No, you? it's not me. That I haven't moved in at that point yet. <laughs> I haven't moved yeah, in at that point yet. Yeah, this was a couple of years back. <laughs> this, yeah. I think I don't think this apartment was built yet. Yeah. This apartment was yeah, still a couple of years back. Sure. Um, yeah, so they they threat- they started threatening me, saying that you get off the pitch, you know, what, you're a girl, what are you doing there? And then I just ignore them, and then they keep asking me to move away, but I refuse because I I don't know what else to do. And then eventually they actually came onto the pitch. Um, I think they were about like a meter away from me before someone actually intervened. So those kind of things I find particularly challenging when you're coaching here. Right. Right. So that again, it's the cultural aspect that that comes into play again. Uh, hopefully, that answers your question, Vishnu. Uh, we next question, uh, Nazrino on Instagram. I think this is going to be applied to both Andy and Cash. Um, is a scouting license a good thing for coaches to have? And I'm assuming for like an extra extra paper. Did you say Nazrin? <laughs> Nazrin, yes, yes. D- you know, you know exactly As who we're talking about. Uh, of course, <laughs> of course, he asked that question. <laughs> Uh, let's start with Andy first this time. Um, well, I 
I don't know because I've never done a scouting qualification, but I would imagine that there's a, an awful lot of positives to it. Um, I would imagine it involves analyzing players' characteristics and their attributes. And as Ketch touched upon earlier, um, maybe it's looking at things you don't normally consider as a coach. So I would imagine it's hugely beneficial. But like I said, I've, I've never done the course. I've Kesh is the only person I've ever known to have done the course. Um, yep. And I've never really had a conversation with her about what it involved or what it entailed. So... Like I said, it's something I'd like to know more about as well. Yep. Cash, can you give us more insight on the scouting license that you have and what you can do with it? Or, so or at least like what you've learned in that scouting paper? So basically, I think the major things that you learn is how to identify behavior and what that relates to. So they usually ask coach, um, scouts to watch a training session and then watch the players' interaction with the managers, with his uh, teammates and with the spectators. And then you watch um, an actual match and then watch their decision making and body language. So they actually go into very detail into how to do that. And they emphasize a lot on character because character you cannot teach, you cannot instill in them, especially at the older age groups, you can't do anything. So character should always come first and then everything else falls later on. Especially when you're scouting at a higher level, I think the skill, the technical skill is pretty much all the same. So you're right. putting character first and then everything else fall behind that. But they also teach you things like how to analyze matches for your own team and for the opposition team and how to do it when you're you know, doing it a few weeks in advance or a few months in advance, how to structure that. And so I found that all of this is pretty much skills that I still use today in my coaching. So actually I do watch other matches and opponent matches weeks in advance, mm. trying to figure out things. So it really helped me massively from that aspect. Okay. Co Coach Nazarene is searching for a course as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, he would I love the sound <laughs> of that. <laughs> but actually, to answer his question, is it a good thing for coaches to have uh, cash? I think so. It helped me, so I would imagine it might help everybody else as well. All right. Um, last question uh, for the both of you. Uh, uh, this time, I, w I think this we've got the same question from the same person, but I'm going to tweak it around to make it more equal this time. Um, what would you like, from Simon Motika, okay, I pronounce it, his name right, Simon Motika, uh, what would you like to see for the future of youth football in Malaysia in, in terms of, for everyone? Uh, cash, and, cash first and then Andy can go. I think for me, the importance is giving everyone equal opportunity and that doesn't mean just gender-wise because mm. uh, what I found that when I first came back to Malaysia, I actually worked with the marginalized community mainly because I feel like football should be a sport that everyone can participate regardless of you know gender, race, your, your area that you grew up in or where you're from. And I think in Malaysia, we're not quite there yet. You know, right. in KL, we are sort of, but beyond the Klang Valley area, I think it's very difficult for people to get into organized um, football with proper training sessions and proper competitive matches and also i think malaysia really lacks in terms of allowing people who are differently able to play football especially youth because in the uk you actually have that structure and i've actually done qualifications to coach differently able players and it really helps them massively but I don't think we have anything even remotely close here. So I think what I want to see is for youth football to be more inclusive in the near future in Malaysia. Right. Andy? Can't really say much more. Um, you know, obviously this, this uh, podcast has been mainly about gender equality, but mm. Kesh has hit the nail on the head there. It's about including everybody um, in the Klang Valley. Uh, that basically extends to, to women and young girls as far as I'm concerned because... Uh, there is pretty much opportunity for everybody to go and play football in some capacity. Maybe it's not quite equal for everybody exactly what opportunities they get, but I would say that the majority of people in Klang Valley have the opportunity to go and play football in some organized format. Mm. But outside of the Klang Valley, it's a very different story. Um, and that's something that we've been working hard on to try and try and establish. Uh, leagues in, in Ipo and Penang have been our first targets. Um, varying levels of success. Um, you know, it's, it's just harder outside of Klang Valley. It's, it's a different uh, setting and scenario altogether. So that's something we're working very hard on is to expand out around Malaysia and, and give everybody opportunities. And um, so for me, it's, it's two parts. In, in Klang Valley, it's about 
women, um, building those those uh, female leagues um, and getting more opportunities for them. Outside of Klang Valley, it's about building it for everybody. Mm. And that wraps us up pretty much nicely for episode 4 of Soccer 60. Thank you so much, Cash, for joining us today. Um, don't forget to give us your feedback. Send us some of your questions. We'd love to hear from you guys. Okay, Don't forget to also subscribe to us on your favourite podcast platforms. Rate us 5 stars if you really enjoyed us. Uh, if you have not, please let us know what we can improve on. We would love to hear from you guys in terms of where we can move forward from. Uh, most importantly, don't forget to follow us at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. That's our social media handles. Stay tuned next week where we speak to Simon Mortica. Until next time, this has been Soccer 60. See you guys next week. <laughs>